Welcome to the dark forest Jackie and her pals will never bore us Shameless confessions about our obsession Will make us laugh and smile So let's explore the dark forest And dork down for a while Hey, it's Jackie Cation. Welcome to the Dork Forest. You know the websites, JackieCation.com, DorkForest.com, TheDorkForest.com, FamilyPetAncestry.com. You're probably already there. Let's do the credits. Mike Rickberg composed and sang that song with his wife, Sarah, that you just heard. He's going to sing his version of the Mexican hat dance at the end of the program. Patrick Brady is going to fix this audio, and Vilmos works on JackieCation.com, the website. There are many ways to support the show. The Amazon link is one. You can use an Amazon link from JackieCation.com or DorkForest.com to go to Amazon. You order like normal and it supports the show. There is a straight up donation button, PayPal or Venmo to this uh, email address that is mine, Jackie at JackieCation.com, where you can just donate to the show if you like the show a lot. I think PayPal has figured out a way to do a monthly. If you want to go monthly, please do. Other ways to support the show if you want to is you can buy merch. There's Dork Forest t-shirts and all the shirts are union made here in America. So they run a little big. Union Bayside. So if you want to look up their size chart. And then the other merch is my stand-up merch. On JackieCation.com, you can watch me do stand-up. You can look at my schedule and the stand-up merch, a couple of different t-shirts, a couple of different enamel pins, and all my CDs and my DVD. If you want to live stream my DVD, it's over there at ComedyFilmNerds.com. They have a live streaming capability, or you can get a hard copy of the DVD on my website. Oh, there are premium episodes at Bandcamp. The dorkforest.bandcamp.com has probably 10 episodes that were done live. They cost me a couple of bucks to make, so I charge you a couple of bucks. If you've run out of regular episodes, go over to ba- the dorkforest.bandcamp.com and get some more. Other than that, I say this. Let's get into the show. Hey, it's Jackie Cation. I'm in my living room with Cindy Campanero. Welcome to the program. Thanks for having me, Jackie. Here you are in my living room. We know each other. You're yeah. a comedy writer. You're a writer. You <laughs> you spend a lot of time uh, putting things on paper and having people say them out loud. Is that correct? <laughs> sort of, yeah. Was that how I defined that? Did I define that correctly? No, you did it pretty good. Good. Uh, the other way I define it is you sit in a room for 14 hours while people tell fisting jokes until someone says something funny. Is that's that- almost, that's very Feel accurate, accurate as well? Yeah. Does that feel like I'm nailing something there? It used to be uh, websites where they would show fisting and they'd want to all watch that during lunch. Oh, yeah? Yeah. I've been feeling lately about uh, how because of the era I was born in yeah. and the being powerless over the era you're born in, <laughs> how I've shouldered the Me Too movement uh, to allow all the young ladies coming up to say uh, that they're not feeling comfortable. Because I had to weather all the discomfort. Right, right. Yeah, you and I, we do, but we also, weirdly enough, tolerate more stuff. Yes. And they don't want to hear it. Right. So my favorite thing about the, the, the next generation of ladies, uh, it's good, right, that coffee? So good. Yeah. Uh, maybe I'll do my own dork forest about how great this coffee is. Damn it. But um, yeah, but I We could have good- done about, about coffee, by the way. Dork. Well, we have yet to begin. So, any- <laughs> We could do it. It could happen right now. But I'm going to tell this damn story about how encouraging I am. Please. You're hearing ice, by the way. Uh, Sorry, ladies, guys. No, no, you will be hearing my ice later. So that'll be fun for everyone. Everyone get a beverage. Uh, it's not a shrimp ring. Get over it. Uh, so, but the, the, the craziness is, is that whenever... Like whenever I, I'm like, well, that's just being a shitty boyfriend. I don't really have a problem with that guy, the way that guy treated his girlfriend. And then they broke up and then they were both mad about it. I was like, that sounds like how people are with their exes and they hate them then. What, ha- how am I supposed to care about that? <laughs> exactly. And then, and, but then also like, like the, the 25 to 35 year old young women comics and stuff that are like, we're not standing for it. I'm like, get them. Get them! I know. I'm like go, go, go! <laughs> and I'm just rooting them on. And uh, I'll, I, you know, we took we took a different bullet. You know, yeah, we did. They're taking a new. It's a it's a new. We, essentially, we have fallen, and they have picked up our rifles, and they continue. <laughs> exactly. And rows of that. So, Cindy Cabanera, by the way, is at C C C A P C C Cap. Yep. Cindy Cabanera is your middle name also a C? 
No, it's Maria. Cynthia Maria <laughs> Campanera. <laughs> I'm an old Italian lady. An old Italian lady. And then it's at Cindy Campanera on the Instagram, correct? Yes. There we go. And you enjoy a procedural. <laughs> I'm a very... Um... It's a very specific law and order kind of... G- the list you sent me is awesome. <laughs> I can't tell you how many do- rangers of the Dork Forest enjoy a law show. They really do. It has to do with justice. I can't handle <laughs> yeah. injustice. And so you like a story where there is justice at the end of it? I like a story with justice. I can't handle people going to jail for the wrong reasons. I can't watch anything with jail or prison. I can't uh, watch people be doing things a- against their will. You know, I like All how... All reality it- shows? The no reality shows. <laughs> no reality no shows. no locked up abroad. No locked up abroad. <laughs> I wouldn't watch Gangs locked up life. Ab- no, Could I you wouldn't- imagine locked up abroad what that fucking show would be like? Uh, Alicia Cooper told me about it at length. And I was like, well, I'm never watching that. I don't need to watch it. But some people, first, I don't know what they get out of it, but they, some people actually get stuff out of it. You like stuff like NYPD Blue, which is, I think, was the first one. I mean, the first one that was, they called it gritty at the time. Yes, they did. And the handheld camera made it very gritty. And it made it real. It felt more real than your Barney Millers and your Columbo's. Exactly. I love a Barney Miller, though. Yeah, I just actually came upon that again, and I thought I would might watch it again. But I have to be mind, I have to be mindful of how much I waste my time. Oh, right, and how much TV is happening? Exactly. Is that what I'm hearing? Okay, so what? So what? some of my favorite NYPD Blue. First of all, I'm crazy about Jimmy Schmitz. Okay. And I say Schmitz, and I know I'm saying it wrong. <laughs> um, but. Just think how happy everyone who's listening to, uh, is feeling to be able to correct you in their minds. So I know that when I listen, I'm like, ha she doesn't know. But you do. Well, I think what happened with NYPD Blue, even as much as I love Dennis Franz, you know, it was, he was, it was difficult. But if you watch it over and over again, like I have with that and Mad Men and um, West Wing, just sort of studying these hour long, how these things are unfolding. And West Wing was sort of like a procedural in a weird way, even though it was about the White House. But Milch, at one point, the language becomes so extraordinary. It, it is its own vernacular. It's, okay. it's mammoth esque, but in a good mammoth esque way, not right. a stupid mammoth way. <laughs> I, right, uh, Mamet doing uh, Mamet correctly. You, uh, yeah, Mamet doing correctly is great. Mamet, uh, the rest of it is just dumbed up. Oh my but, god! Have you ever seen Glenn Gary done badly? Uh, I like I two hundred like... year old guys. <laughs> You're like, are you fucking kidding me? Do you understand rhythm at all? Because that's all he writes is rhythm. Right, he's writing an iambic pentameter. Feel free to speak in it. <laughs> and uh, so, who's Milch? David Milch was the creator with Stephen Bochco. Oh, right? was he? Okay, yes. and. But here's the other thing. Oh, I have so many thoughts now. I hope I can say them all in a way that's <laughs> comprehensible. Is that I, a word? I believe I don't, in you. Y- what? I don't have a lot of good words to say, but I think really good words. Do you think really good words? Well, tell me what you think about <laughs> NYPD Blue. All right. First of all, like I said, the... When was some, it on? It was started, I think, in 94... Okay. Maybe and went to like 2000 and something. Okay, so maybe 10 years of NYPD. 12 seasons. 12 seasons. And Smith, Jimmy Smith came in uh, season, middle of season two. Okay. Well, you know, that was, whole, that was David Caruso's whole thing. David Caruso was the star of that show for the first season. Okay. I don't know if he was self-destructive or what his game was, but it was, it became a huge hit and he left it. Oh, okay. And that's why he got so blacklisted in Hollywood, because he was such a fucking, like, what? And then he came back to do the sunglass cop in <laughs> Miami whatever. <laughs> Miami Miami Vice? franchise. No, um, oh, the CSI Miami, Miami, maybe? Oh, that sounds right. He's one of those, he was a blonde guy who, who blonde guys age differently. Strawberry blonde. Yeah, but blonde guys age differently than dark-haired guys Pasty. for some reason. Yeah, dude, it's weird. But, uh... Yeah, but he was a handsome uh, young blonde guy, if I remember correctly. I'll tell you what. If you watch that first season, he is so good in it. Yeah, that He's first season of Edward. extraordinary, extraordinary in it. And What do you just, like about it? I don't like it. Um, it. It's not for me, those cop shows, but I don't dislike them. Oh, really? Yeah, what, what, what's great about NYPD Blue? Is that that ensemble cast? Well, I think this is what I'm saying. Whenever I watch it... 
I'm looking at different actors. Like Sharon Lawrence was in it in the beginning, who on the A side, I thought she was fantastic. And, you know, she was only supposed to be in the pilot and she wound up being Sipowitz's wife. Okay. For, the, for as long as she wanted to. And then mm-hmm. ultimately she got killed off. And Dana Delaney, Dana, oh no, Kim Delaney from mm-hmm. All My Children. That was like her biggest thing after All My Children, if you're okay. an All My Children fan. And Jimmy Smith's, of course, came over from L.A. Law. Yep. Bochco's show. And I like watching shows after they're over because they don't make me nervous. Okay. Right, right. There's no tension. Right. You know that. It's already happened. It's the already- show's over. I don't have to be, I'm invested, but not that invested. Yeah, yeah. There's a detachment there. So instead of watching a Real Housewives or something like that, I can watch that. I can fold clothes keep it on in the background like I have a friend. Um, and I just watch the, you know, some of the things aren't that, you know. And also, the exterior of the show was right around the block from where I lived when I lived in New York. So all those New York shots. So I'm like, oh, there's Fifth Street. There's that park. That's okay. where that homeless person tried to pee on me. <laughs> so it is very much like, oh, I almost had friends. Remember when I had friends? <laughs> I, I, I almost used to do a thing. Remember when I was outside more? And uh, <laughs> so, but are there, are there crimes that you, that are resolved in, in NYPD? Oh, yeah, Blue? yeah. They get a lot of, um, you know, this is what I love about cop shows. Yeah. A, they always talk about how this is the job. <laughs> and I always think like being a comedy writer I wish I could just stand up in the writer's room and say, this is the job and this is how I do my job. (laughs) And this is, there's, we don't cross the line, you know, (laughs) it's not like the backstab, whatever the fuck we experience being (laughs) a television writer. Oh my God. That's I literally, that is what Laurie Kilmartin does. I think in the Conan writer's room, I think she does stand up and go, this is the job. I know it's the funnest thing, but one of my favorite lines in, and then you see how they're, what you know if you're a tv writer and you're watching a tv show you're always breaking down the scenes and why they needed that scene to set up that story and they could have done it without that scene but that scene wasn't so bad so bad and blah 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 but there was one storyline where they it was when sipowitz was still i mean when jimmy smith was still on the show and he goes into a room and there's the woman's dead of course there's it's always women dead women raped you know right. i always have to be mindful of what i'm letting into my brain Right. Because, and also these are 10 o'clock shows and then you're going right to bed. Yeah, that's dumb. So like the SVU show, I call the rape show. And then everybody watches a rape and goes to bed and then they wonder why fucking women are like getting killed in domestic violence. Whatever. I have my own theories. (laughs) But clearly (laughs) this one specific episode, I was laughing my ass off because the guy whose sister is dead in her room um, is sitting on the couch and he's a emotion mentally challenged fellow yes but of course this is like 95 right so and so they're like all the hey. sensitivity of 1994 exactly hey did you see your sister i don't know what happened to my you know he's talking like that and then they go and then he says to them do i need a lawyer <laughs> do i need a lawyer and i'm like why is the mentally challenged guy even no that he might need a lawyer. Like, Maybe why he, did they need to set up that part of the story in that right. scene? With the, and why did they give that character those words? Do I need a lawyer? Why, where would it even occur to him that he might need a lawyer? Well, maybe he watched NYPD Blue and he <laughs> knew that he might need a lawyer. Here's my thing. But wait, wait, wait. Let me okay. just finish this thing. Yeah, yeah. So then Sip, Jimmy Smith goes back to the, the house, you know, it all happens oh, in their house. No, okay. the precinct, precinct. And says to the lieutenant, um, the retarded guy wants to know if he needs a lawyer. <laughs> Jimmy Smith says that. Well, and retarded is the medical term, especially in 1995. But I mean, he's like, the no, he said the retarded guy's going to lawyer up. <laughs> Just like, what happened to and that was episode? It, was he supposed to, was he going for the laugh? No, he's he was just updating <laughs> updating the lieutenant on what the what the you know the with all case the po- was. all the different parts of the case. Exactly. So 
And I'm just like, really? Who wrote that? I don't know. Well, and the weird thing is, is they want us to think that everybody did it, right? I mean, you're supposed to, every new character you meet, you're like, well, maybe that guy did it. Maybe that woman did it. Maybe that guy did it. Maybe that woman did it. And they wanted us to think that the retarded guy might have done it. Yes, that's true. But the fact that they gave the re- the mentally challenged man the wherewithal to ask for a lawyer felt to me like there was some misstep that happened in the writer's room with the story. Or maybe Milch said, I'm just going to throw it in here for some weird reason. Do you know him? No. I don't know him. I say Milch like I know him. You do say Milch like you know mm-hmm. him. It's uh, I keep thinking of Turns Mulch. out he lost all his money gambling. Did he? Yeah, I found that out last year. Well, you know what? There's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of dudes who are just like... Well, it's been a great run. I guess I'm going to divorce my wife and go to Vegas and uh, lose throw thirty-two it all. million dollars. Exactly. Somehow, buy. I should have bought land. But here's the other thing I'm going to say about Stephen Bochco. Then we can switch topics. Unless you want to talk a little bit. No, no. That's and then what, I'll be quiet. No, please. Plug and play, Cindy Campanera. <laughs> Plug and play. <laughs> no, because sometimes you know I came up through Second City. I came up as an actress performer. I was one of those people that did a lot of characters very quickly. Not not what's his name weird like that (laughs) robin williams not robin williams e in that fucking way but in a way that you know i've done one woman shows i can i can move from person to person in a way that's um yeah you know entertaining let's say you're definitely entertaining. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what you're saying character-wise. How what I'm trying characters? to say is yeah. I came up with a lot of people, and we all did a lot of characters. So okay. it wasn't weird to uh, when I became more of a writer than an actor to come up with characters for shows because okay. that's what I did my whole career, early okay. career. Yeah, yeah. And I've worked along genius people, Joe Liss, Rose Abdu, you know, just genius people that could do ton of characters and okay jill tally you know these great rose abdu has been on the dork forest yeah she's fantastic she uh she makes art on the inside of uh bottle caps yeah like a like a crazy person yeah like a a dork it's awesome she is a dork (laughs) she's a beautiful dork forest i gotta have her back gotta have her back on um so then i was watching a show where steven bochco is talking about the characters he created for hill street blues okay and he was so precious. Are we talking about Hill Street Blues or, or no? NYPD he created Blue? both shows. Did he? Yes. Well, I don't, oh I'm not part God. of show business that isn't who. <laughs> who was supposed to? <laughs> well, be in I live charge. in Los Angeles. <laughs> I don't. I don't do any research for the Dork <laughs> Forest. The great thing about me is that I get to ask all the questions that 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 are some people might think are too dumb. <laughs> <laughs> no, so I remember him sitting watching like one of these CNN shows or something, and he's talking about a character that he created for NYPD Blue, and he was a cop <laughs> that was so mad he would bite his own fist. And I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? That's the, that I could was come the up kid. with nine of those guys while I'm taking a crap. <laughs> And you're talking about him like you just created like some Shakespearean character? <laughs> and is that my problem that I don't rest so earnestly in these things I create that look at this hack uh, character that I came up with. And but the thing is is you're still mesmerized by the guy who bites his fist. No, you're not. You're like, this is the hackiest shit I ever saw. And yet you watch it on repeat. I don't watch Hill Street Blues on repeat. <laughs> I had a guy tell me, and it must have been 93, 92, I was doing Iowa, and a guy comes up to me after the show, he said, you know, it it must have been right when uh, NYPD Blue started. He said, you can hit me if you want, but I have to tell you this thing. And I said, there's no hitting in grown-up land. I have since (laughs) disproved this several times, sadly. But uh, I said, uh, I said, what? He said, you remind me of a female Dennis Franz. And I was like, well, you don't have to say everything out loud. <laughs> That's not true. <laughs> well, I have all my hair. Um, so, yeah, but, but I, I think he's wrong. Someone called, said I put them in mind of a young Martha Ray. <laughs> and he wore his spaghetti that day. <laughs> Fucking asshole. It was some guy that was came into the restaurant but that I worked at in college. Some mm-hmm. big, doofy, greasy... I'm Dumb like, dumb. really? I put you in mind of that? Here's what you put me in mind of. <laughs> well, I mean, that's the thing is that then it be- just becomes a name calling thing. All you can do is just laugh and keep moving. Oh, brother. But here's my thing. NYPD Blue. That was Dennis Franz. Yes. Uh, Sipowitz. And his wife. And then Jimmy Smits. And then 
Jimmy what? Smith was Bobby Simone. Bobby Simone. And then was there a lady cop? There's almost always a lady Kim cop. Kim Delaney. Kim Delaney. And, um, and did she always talk to the, the rape victims? Well, you know, that show wasn't necessarily always about that. It there was always murders, but not necessarily. And sometimes and there was there, that. Wasn't there like a, t- it was always murder. Yeah, that's right. It was homicide. And then, the, but there was always a parallel track of somebody's personal life, right? Yeah. Well, they always go into personal stories. I well, mean, you have to. There's two, there are usually two homicide stories or two cop stories. And mm-hmm. then you're following the lives of these policemen. And Simone and Kim Delaney's character, who I can't remember, Diane something, Mm -hmm. they were lovers. And so there was a lot of, but it was also a show, one of the first shows that dealt with AA. Oh, wow. Yeah. And they had two alcoholics in the show, which was actually really pushing the boundaries of it. But so they (laughs) worked with that a little bit and that was kind of new. And then all the kind of raw sex stuff was new at that time. Right. That's why it was gritty. Well, That's they right. showed Dennis Franz's ass. That's right. There was a, there was big talk that because we got to see his butt. Yeah, and uh... got to or <laughs> <laughs> well, wh- who's to say? <laughs> who's to say? So, but you said that you watched The West Wing as well. Yes, huge West Wing fan. How many how many seasons of that were there? Seven. Okay, I, I... and Jimmy Smith is in the seventh ep- uh, seventh season as the new Democratic. Um, nominee and i'll tell you what you watch one episode of west wing yeah and you see how badly trump is at his job oh right because of how much the job is or yes because it's a good description of what the job is supposed to be like because you just in a fictional tv character does more work than our actual president (laughs) well i remember when um Bush stole the election in 20. Yeah. And uh, this is an opinion I think Rangers are aware that I have. No, it's so not I an opinion. The American president. Oh, I love on it. On repeat. Yes. 200 times. Right. And my upstairs neighbor <laughs> would, she would get her mail, which was right outside my front door, and she'd be like, you watching that that movie again? It's like Annette Benning's really really cute, and uh, <laughs> so, and Michael Douglas. Michael Douglas feels to me to some extent like an empty vessel. Oh my god! You could pour a script into that guy, and he turns into that person. Well, we'll Wall have Street, have a different... American President Henry Pym. Those are the three I can think of right now. But here's um, the other thing I like about romancing the stone anyway (laughs) i like to watch moments with actors oh yeah yeah i'm a big moment watcher for like oh i love that moment when they played that thing and west wing had a ton of those oh yeah you could watch that so when you bring up american president there's one scene that because also written by sorkin yes and he cribbed off of his own movie yes he did yeah but when the daughter's playing the cello and says don't be uh don't be lame when he's going out to... Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. She says, don't be... Some- something. Something it, lame or something. Yeah, and you're like, you know what? Just get rid of that scene. <laughs> it's just a terrible... It's is like there- in Moonstruck. Oh, the whole there- scene, the whole movie's just perfection, except the scene where Cher comes back with her new shoes and has to try them on in front of a mirror. Oh. To an 80s saxophone. <laughs> it's like everything else was absolutely... To the moment, perfect in that movie, except that little... It was like beat for beat for beat. You exactly. Were like, and then, but the thing is, is you're watching this, do you think it's because you've seen it so many times or it's because you're professional? Like it's this business. I think it was always my love of it that made me... Because when you were a kid, did you watch shows and go, that was almost perfect? Well, I knew what I liked about it. I knew like, this is a little braggy, but... That'll happen. I had Faye Dunaway in my living room. She wasn't hostage or anything. She was there freely. Faye Dunaway came over to your house when you were yeah. a child? No, here in L.A. Why? There was Did just you have a podcast? reasons for her oh, to be there. Okay. It's, uh... But anyhow, we talked at length about that moment in Network where she starts shaking with the tea cup when he okay. says, I'm leaving. Yeah. Like, just stuff like that. And that was that, that's a great scene? I well, never saw a Network. Oh. Do you know Why? Why? Sounds tense. No, you need to see network. <laughs> I can't see network. Why? I'm living network. I'm good. I'm I'm already experiencing a li- a real live uh, amount of. It, it is exactly. But I'll tell you what. There's some of the funniest stuff you've ever seen in there. I do like clips. I'll watch clips of network. Did you see the clip of the PLO group? Fighting about their back end. <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm telling you what. 
they're a terrorist organization. They're holed up in this weird little fucking <laughs> abandoned house. And the one woman who's hilarious, and I don't know this actress's name, is just yelling about how you're not going to fuck with my back end. <laughs> Wait, and this is in network? In the movie network, yes. Oh, my God. <laughs> because Faye Dunaway plays a producer who's trying to, basically, it's the beginning of reality TV. Wow. Yeah, yeah. That's that, that's the other reason why I won't watch it. But it doesn't mean that I don't know that it isn't really well done. How can this coffee taste half like chocolate milk and half like coffee? I don't know. And there's no flavoring in it at all. It's this unbelievable. This is this Vietnamese coffee that I tried when I was in Vietnam, tried to find it for sale here in America, could not. Eventually, Facebook messaged our tour guide from Vietnam and then paid him a fairly large amount of money uh, but not too much money. It ends up being probably, he either sent 10 pounds or he sent 20 pounds. And if it was 20 pounds, that means it was 10 bucks a pound. It is so damn good. It is amazing. Am I going to get high off this? Because I feel- You are not. You are not going to get it high. Is you're so just going to be, you're going to say to yourself, where do I get that? And Qua said to me when, when I, because I, I sent him an extra couple of bucks, right? Uh-huh. And he goes, if people like it. Let's start a business. And I'm like, you are constantly uh, working an angle. Nobody's working harder than the people of Vietnam. Nobody, I've never tasted anything so th- this delicious. It's delicious. As it doesn't taste like flavored coffee, folks. Exactly. That's the weird thing but about it. But it has a weird chocolatey vibe to it. It has a chocolate or hazelnutty. It, fe- it has a smell where it feels like it's been flavored, but it has not been flavored. And... It's just the the countryside where it grew. It has this sort of weird, nutty, chocolatey kind of note to it, which I've never said in my was whole it, life. <laughs> was it grown in Count Chocula? It was grown in a, in a in a rice paddy where I'm sure John McCain <laughs> crashed at least twice. Do you know that he crashed five times in Vietnam? He wasn't a good flyer. No, but he was a good survivor. But he was a good survivor, and he was a and he passed away recently. And he so did he a, be nice. Yeah, he did a nice. Thing. occasionally yeah, so For, there you go at the end there <laughs> he did what he could when so he but other up. favorite scenes okay so because i think <clears throat> that's your real dorkdom is some of your favorite scenes in movies that have some flaws like did you ever see uh shawshank redemption uh yes but i saw it when i was on a first date and i kept oh just that's wanting impossible to make out right uh, Andy Ashcraft has never been able to sit through Midnight Run. For that Although I love Midnight Run. Midnight Run is one of the greatest movies one in the world. One of the greatest. It's I one agree. of the great buddy movies of all time. And um, there is, and in my opinion, there isn't a bad scene. In fact, the oh, somebody was just telling me about the guy that wrote that. His name is Gallo. And I can't get into that long story. But no, yeah, yeah, we can. were just talking about sure Midnight can. Run. We can, um, but yeah, because we... We got time. I mean, Midnight Run has so many great scenes. It has so many. It's it's they're bounty hunters. They're there's the bad guy. Uh, I'll tell you who's great in NYPD Blue. Who the Bond guy in there Midnight Run? Joe Pant- no, Pantalone. Is that how you say his name? That sounds right. And one of my favorite episodes. He's in NYPD Blue. Yes, he plays sort of a snitch. Yeah, and he. And Lieutenant Fancy, who actually was a uh, New York actor who used to work for an organization called the 52nd Street Project, that my husband's ex-wife, who yep. was an actress, I just found out he used to be married, and we've been married 23 years. What? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, but anyhow, so Joe Pan- Joey Pants plays a, a, like a snitch character, and him and Fancy set up this prick of a internal affairs guy in one of my favorite NYPD Blue episodes. Yeah. And uh, is justice always served in the NYPD Blue? No. That's... I mean, sometimes you have to eat it and you're sad. Yeah. And then sometimes I watch that and I think, well, maybe that's what drama writing is. You have to be not afraid to end something sad. And my thing is, I don't like to end sad. <laughs> no, no. There's things in real life that end sad. Well, that's my, you know, I took some acting classes because my friend had a school. She's like, come and be in class. It'll be fun. Right. Anyhow, it was awful. <laughs> and I said to my friend later, I'm like, I don't have to work up to a cry. I wake up crying. I don't have You're to like the Hulk. Of things. You're always angry. <laughs> exactly. and so, I don't have to think of things to make me mad or sad. Right. I see it every day. Every day. And there was a woman, well, I used to listen to hip hop at my 
day job in the 90s. Mm -hmm. And um, there was a Native American woman that I worked with named Cindy, who was one of the most powerful human beings. My name's Cindy. Right. Am I Native American? No, her name wasn't. It was Cynthia. Oh, my real name, Cynthia. But yeah. go ahead. She was, uh, you're very powerful, but uh, you are not a powerful Native American. No. She was Lakota, and she was genuinely terrifying. She was hilarious, but have you ever met, like, these people that are, that, and they're often, for me, have always, they've always been women who are sort of, they they aren't cold, but they're cold, and you're just like, and they're hilarious. So she was super smart. But she was also, you could tell that there was just a depth of rage in her that was oh, outstandingly yeah. hilarious. They're to almost some like too self possessed. Right. You're like, right. let go of the thing a little bit. <laughs> so, Cynthia, she was like, I can't believe you like this hip hop. What do you like about it? And I said, well, I, I like to listen to the political stuff because it kind of gets me mad. And there was this beat of silence. And she goes, <laughs> You need music to get mad? <laughs> <laughs> no shit. And then she walked away and I laughed and was terrified. And <laughs> <laughs> no, when your whole life is an injustice, how do you fucking right. manage that rage? And how do you, well, how can you listen to something that's just going to make you matter? I know. Like, you, what are you going to do with it? it? You don't need to. Yeah. That's the thing about watching things about injustice. What do I do with my rage now that I've seen it? I can't do anything. Like when I saw Jesus Camp for the first time. Have you What's ever that? seen Jesus Camp? Oh, is that the uh, gay conversion thing? No, it's a... <laughs> That's what I assumed it was. No, it seems like it would be that. Yeah. But it is a movie about tiny, tiny little kids being exposed to people that want them to just know Jesus better, but in a real in evangelical way. So all these... A mean l- Jesus? No, to know Jesus better. Right, but which Jesus? Evangelical Jesus. Which is the mean Jesus, right? The I one suppose, who's going to send you to hell? That Jesus? Well, yes, there's the fire and brimstone element of it, but more more devastating to me is that little, little kids feel bad if they don't feel super close to Jesus, like if they can't find the thing. Oh, if they don't find their spirituality in, yes. when they're six? yes. They're, or they're five, judged, or one of them, they're, or they're not getting the calling to be a preacher. Wow. Yeah. And so these kids are crying. And I was like, I know this is a movie, but I'm going to call DCSF right now <laughs> and find out it's who made this fucking movie? movie. No, it's real. It was a documentary? Yes. Called Jesus Can. <laughs> well, I'm never watching it. But no, I because mean... you'll kick the TV down. Right, right. What? Um... So, because I remember being little, raised Catholic. And you're like, what seven-year-old has to formulate questions like these? Oh, sister, what if I was on my way to church, but I ate some meat right before communion, and I was going to do an act of contrition, but I got hit by a car, and I died. Would I still not be able to go to heaven? Who's formulating thoughts like that when you're six and seven years old? Well, that's the pitch, though, isn't it? The pitch is that... I remember once, I think I was about nine years old, and my sister and I were in Sunday school, and we had the weirdest Sunday school teacher for a short amount of time, and she was talking- She was like, this is bullshit. <laughs> well, my sister and I were like, this is bullshit. Why? What because was she saying? Because every other uh, teacher was just like, here, paint this co- color. This is, you just, because <laughs> Armenian church uh, lasts three hours. Oh, so oh. you went to Sunday school so that you didn't have to stand for three hours. Right. You only had to stand for about 45 minutes to an hour 15 and um, to listen to the sermon, to get communion. And so this teacher was like, sometimes uh, when people are mean, their karma, it, it was essentially karma is inst- instant. God will smite you if you do something bad. Mm. And she said, and then she told a story about a little boy who, um, was mean to his sister at breakfast, walked to school, got hit by a car. And Darla, I remember Darla looking at me and bursting out laughing and I in Sunday it. school. And I was like, what, what is that? And she was like, not true. And we both got kicked out of Sunday school that day and we're driving home. And, uh, and my dad is like, so how was it? Because the woman didn't narc on us or anything. Knock. Anyway, the woman didn't narc on us, but my dad was like, so how was Sunday school? And, Darla was like, you're not going to believe what the Sunday school teacher told us. And we told him. And then he 
uh, got her, her fired. <laughs> he was like, okay, you got to get your shit together because that isn't uh, what we're doing here. I we're love mostly that just your sister lunch. called bullshit right away. Yeah, she she was like 10 or 11 years old. Because she could have totally internalized that. And then yeah. that would have been that thing. Right. She was like, nope, that's not how it works. <laughs> Oh, God love her. <laughs> she uh, is smarter than the average bear, Darlication. And, um, but, so, NYPD Blue. Yes. Did you watch it when it was, you only watched it when it was over? Yeah, I didn't like it when it was on. I'm like, who do they think they are with that handheld camera? And I'm fucking dizzy watching all the... <laughs> I never like things when they're on. I don't know. I get mad or judgmental or... <laughs> and then later, I'm like, what was all the hellabaloo about? <laughs> and I turn it on. And then you're like, oh my God, this is actually quite quite good. Is that what happened with Mad Men? Mad or Bad, Men, Breaking Bad or whatever? I never what watched the... Breaking Bad. Mad Men, I couldn't watch initially because the misogyny was so overpowering. I had to like not watch it. But then, and this is what I'll talk about in terms of moments and stuff like that. Watching C.J. Craig's character, watching Allison Janney's character, C.J. Craig on West Wing, mm -hmm. and watching um, Elizabeth Moss's character, Peggy Olsen, on Mad Men. And I even did this with Jessica Fletcher on Murder, She Wrote. I learned from these ladies. I watched these ladies be in these professional situations and maintain their dignity and confidence and struggle with their leadership. And I watched... Like, for example, with Murder, She Wrote, and I had, I wrote all this stuff down in a show that I did once, but I watched, you know, Angela Lansbury in her high-waisted jeans and her nice jacket, and she would say <laughs> stuff, she was always very pointed, like, you know, um, so Roger, I think that you were at the boathouse at 10 o'clock, right? and he would say something back to her, and she'd say, you know what, let me think about that, and she'd walk away, Yeah, I'm like, you're going to buy yourself some time right now by telling him you're going to think about, like, you don't have to feel like you have to please him right now by telling him what he wants to hear. Yeah, yeah. So, like... That's huge. It was huge. I'm like, oh, my God. And then I would watch the, you know, the C.J. Craig character in in West Wing goes from being a press secretary to the chief of staff. She winds up losing a lot of the thing that made her fun, not the actress, but the character, right. because she has so much responsibility. Right. But she does have to step into this role that is much more uh, difficult because she's around these five guys all day. And she's, and then even and watching the Peggy Olsen character in Mad Men, whenever she has to, I mean, she started as like a ponytailed. You the know, cutie McCute uh, assistant kid, right? Yeah, she was manning some guy's desk, and she mm -hmm. winds up becoming a copywriter in a time when no women were doing that. And so every time she has to do something hard, there's always a moment where she's breathing in and kind of like taking in, taking like inventory of who she is, and then she does the hard thing. She girds her loins and then jumps into it. Yes, and yeah. so you watch all these women do the hard thing. Yeah. And what the ramifications of that are and how there's a conflict about it and they do it anyhow. Yep. And what happens on the B side of that. Stuff right, right. Like it's that. sort of it's sort of a great example of how representation matters. And because the thing is, is we were all raised by people who were doing those things. Like like we never got to witness our moms and our dads making the hard decisions and then right. doing the thing. We just because got hit. we were children. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. I mean, they they by the time by the time they got home, they were just ready to take it out on us. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, but they did make those decisions and they right. did have to stand up for themselves and stuff like that. And I'm sure uh, we were all, you know, people are encouraged to do these things when they're children, but to see it acted out, that's the beautiful thing about theater and television and acting and, and art is that you get this representation and you're like, oh, I can learn this. And I mean, when you think about little kids who watch the same movie over and over and over and mm -hmm. over and over and over again, that's what are they learning? You know, like if you're watching Frozen over and over and over again, you're learning essentially that, first of all, that, that girl's parents are terrible because uh, they should have uh, taught her how to use her magic, not hit her away, and then accidentally died. Uh, so uh, I'm I sure... Don't, I haven't seen it yet. Don't, don't ruin it. Allow me to spoil <laughs> Frozen for you. <laughs> but there's... But there's... When, when the kids watch the, mo the shows over and over again, I always want to watch it 
with them to see what they're seeing. Right. You know, Homeward Bound, one of my nieces loved Homeward Bound. And I remember the first time I saw it with her on VHS. And You're like, what's so special about that dog? Well, in this one, I don't know the older about. dog. At oh, one is it point, about dogs? It is. Yeah. Oh, it's completely. <laughs> And she, and she was like three or four years old. She used to call it Homeward Pound. <laughs> Adorable. Uh, so, uh, but uh, the Irish setter at one point, uh, it looks like uh, she he's died. He oh. or she has died. And I literally, tears are streaming down my face as I'm watching this. And she's three or four years old. She, I remember her just walking up to me going, it's okay. It's okay. He's coming. He's coming. And I was like, oh, thank God. <laughs> and, uh, but it's, but it's like, I mean, to see those moments in television, even if, you know, like I, I remember watching, there were guy characters and I would have to extrapolate. I'd be like, okay, that's how I would, I would deal with that. But to actually see a woman do it in a situation where you're more likely to have been for Angela Lansbury to go, no, you can wait for me and my pleasure. Right. I'm going to be in my garden with a big hat on, <laughs> and I'm going to come back to you and when I keep asking you, where were you at 930? <laughs> um, I also like to watch scenes over again. Like sometimes I'll watch a show, and then I'll be watching one actor, and then I'll watch it again. I'll be like, that actor's bugging me now, and I'm watching another actor. Because I said <laughs> that actor's bugging you. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, oh, look, he, look at the shit he's doing now. And then I'll have a new found something for someone like, I don't know. I just like watching them act together and seeing what they're offering and why they played the moment like that or why the director, you know. Oh, I have the funniest story to tell you about my father. Please. Why hold back? Well, just in terms of this. <laughs> We're recording. <laughs> when No, because now I, maybe I see where it comes from. Like, yeah. My father, you know, he's a retired fire chief. He, In fact, one of the law shows I really liked was Boston Legal, only because I loved James Spader and I loved his monologues. And it turned out a really good friend of mine wrote a lot of his monologues in Boston Legal. And I called my dad once during the writer's strike because... My first play was about the Chicago fire strike when my dad was on strike. So I had his jacket on during the writer's strike, and I called him up to bond about, you know, yeah. look at me, I'm on strike. And he's like, hey, you still got uh, those friends that write on uh, Boston Legal? I go, yeah. He goes, because I got some ideas for Denny Crane. And I'm like, <laughs> but the thing about it is because he had ideas for Denny Crane. And yeah. so he, he asked me this question once in complete sincerity, not about Boston Legal. He's like, you know what? I was watching a movie the other day, and uh, what's her name? Uh, Jean Tierney, someone like that. Right. She was uh, she was making a bed, see? And I'm <laughs> telling you what, she was really making that bed. I mean, she was putting the corners under. She was making the sheet, making the sheet real straight. She kept going back and forth, making sure the bed looked. And I was wondering, you know, did she think of doing that or... Was it in the script that she should make the bed that way? Or did right. the director tell her to make that bed that way? Yeah, that's like, totally where you got that because that is you. Is that you exactly are, that's that? That's exactly what you're doing. You're looking at every scene going, look at the choices these actors are making. <laughs> look at the choices that actor's making. I'm going to start bawling right now. It's uh, Let me just, uh, but that's great. <laughs> that's really good, but it's nice. And I always thought that was hilarious, but then I always thought it was so insightful for him to... To see that. See that. Because he would call me with sketches when I was at SNL and stuff. Yeah. Fully formed sketches. <laughs> right. He's like, you could have one guy, he's like a, a punk guy, let's say, and he's, you know. <laughs> I'm like, that actually isn't a bad idea. It's not a bad idea. Sometimes they're sometimes they're coming up with good ideas. I know. And then other times you're like, nobody asked. Nobody asked you. But uh, that's true of me. <laughs> so <laughs> sometimes I got great ideas and then other times... Uh, I want to tell myself that it uh, doesn't possibly matter. Can't possibly matter. But here's the thing you want to be mindful of in your new law shows. Yeah. And your new procedurals. This has become a popular thing. I think it's a very dangerous thing. Yeah. It's very lazy writing to me. I'm acting like it's real serious. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm like, what are, are, are lives being changed? What's happening? The contraception. No. It's when people start seeing. You know who does it a lot is um, like NC. NCIS? One, is that the, the original one with, one with Mark? Pam Dauber's husband? 
I don't know, Pam Tauber's husband. Mark Harmon? Yes. Okay. Um, <laughs> wow, you sound like me. <laughs> no, when they say, let me get this straight. Oh. That's, a, that's relatively contemporary. They're trying to... They're trying to summarize summarize and get people who are just tuning in on board. Right, right. Let me get this straight. He was home at 930 <laughs> and then he left at 1030 and now he's saying that hour he and can't he account turns for. Like yeah. Columbo and goes, one last thing. But here's the thing about Columbo. Yeah. <laughs> oh wait, and I'm so sorry. Yes. Columbo, you know who the murderer is. Going Always in. going in. Oh, I did not know that. And so the trick of Columbo, the game that my husband and I play is, when does he know? Oh, when does Columbo know? Because we already know. You always know That's it's the guest game. star. Oh, but, you always know it's the guest star. Right. But he doesn't know. That. I mean, you know. And so, and I told you the story about my husband meeting Steven, Steven Spielberg and only talking to him about Columbo. No. Oh, uh, your brother. husband met Steven Spielberg and they wanted to discuss Columbo? I was working on a show where Steven Spielberg's daughter was the star. Okay. And him and Kate. How'd she get that gig? Just kidding. It was Kate Capshaw's daughter. Okay. Jessica Capshaw. She's a really fun. I'm nice sure she's actress. a great. I, I, I'm she's sure it's not the, a rowing scholarship to Harvard. Keep talking. Go ahead. <laughs> and uh, anyhow, they would come like after dinner on Fridays to the tapings. Nice. And my husband came one Friday and he was like, you got to introduce me to Steven Spielberg. 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 I'm like, no, 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 I'm not doing that. Please, you, please introduce me. Nope, I'm not. I'm not. Uh, please, please, please. Okay. <laughs> I go up. He's like on his own monitor. We're all in Video Village. He's on his own monitor. And um, my husband's like, uh, I said, okay, fine. Mr. Spielberg, this is my husband, Pete DeCoast. This is Steven Spielberg. <laughs> my husband's got a lot to say, apparently. And I just walked away. Pete, Steven, Steven, Pete. And so the first thing Pete says is, uh, not for nothing, but I, you know, not for nothing. I love Schindler's List, but Jaws is my favorite movie. It's the first thing he says. Well, and then unsolicited. And then Spielberg <laughs> says, if I didn't do Jaws, I wouldn't have been able to do Schindler's List. And they're having a nice conversation, which ba then quickly turns to, because Spielberg directed one of the very first Columbos oh, that he? starred Jack Cassidy. It was the second one. Okay. Who's S Jack Cassidy? Jack Cassidy was David Cassidy's father. Okay. Married to Shirley Jones. Oh, nice. And he did three Columbos. Okay. So uh, two where he was some sort of writer, publisher, and one where he was a Nazi magician. <laughs> Wait, so he played three different characters? Three different Columbos as three, three different characters. Right, he was on the same program, same actor, playing three different characters who were always the murderer, one yeah. imagines. Uh, that is some 1970s shit right oh there. Oh my God. That is oh amazing Oh my God, I gotta casting. tell you, Robert Culp played three, two or three, he was in two or three episodes, but there was one we just watched recently where he murders, <laughs> he murders Pat Crowley from... Please don't eat the daisies. <laughs> but he's wearing like chips glasses, you know, those shades right, right, that those are mirrored. aviator shades, yeah. Except, so this is the shot. The shot is his head with those glasses on. Yeah. But in the glass. Yeah, you could see. We see him committing the murder. So it's, first of all, it's <laughs> quad screen, the crazy face, the glasses with the mirrors. And then in the mirrors, you see the murder. Yeah, you do. Oh, man. It doesn't get any better. <laughs> that is just good writing from top to bottom. So good. It's more like comic book writing because <laughs> you're like in frame panel number one. It is so awesome. That is awesome. Like your buddy Leonard Nimoy. Me and my friend Leonard Nimoy. He's in a fantastic episode called Stitch in Crime, and he plays a surgeon. Oh. That, And this is a rare one because Columbo cannot get him. Does he at some point and he at realizes the very, that very, it's him. very end? But he knows that he does it. Okay. And sometimes when Columbo gets mad, he'll get mad and he'll say stuff like, "I know you did it. I might not have the proof right now, but I know you did it." Yeah. Or he tells them misinformation to get them off their game. Yeah, yeah. That's how Columbo plays. That's how Columbo plays. 
So how did he get him in the in the final hour? In stitching crime. This is a spoiler alert from fifty years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Leonard Nimoy goes back into surgery and removes some uh, stitches that he had planted the first time to try to kill a doctor. Right. So Colombo can't get him. Colombo can't get him. Anyhow, at the very very end, Leonard Nimoy does something uncharacteristic, which is he pushes Colombo away from him. Yeah. And at the very, very end, Leonard Nimoy thinks that he got away with it, and Columbo ca- comes back in. What happened was Leonard Nimoy put the stitches that he removed from that body into Columbo's pocket, knowing that Columbo would never be searched. Oh. And Columbo got him at the very, very end. Because he you searched didn't think- himself. Yeah. He was because like, Why because is there Nimoy these- pushed him. Yeah. And Nimoy was always supposed to be this really kind of oh, self-possessed he never man. Anybody. Yeah. And when he pushed him, that's what gave him away. Okay. So that made Columbo check all of his rumpled pockets. pockets. Yes. Rumpled, rumpled pockets. Yes. Nice. Good Lord. Aren't you? I, it's good I'm already married, right? Because I don't know who would date me. <laughs> <laughs> well, luckily, uh, it's all working out. <laughs> The movie The Firm? Oh my God, the movie The Firm? John Grisham? No, I've I've, I've never even read any John Grisham. It's the only, I read two John Grishams. Okay. No, I read The Firm when I was visiting my sister in New Mexico 100 years ago. Okay. I read it in like four hours. Right, right, you just consumed I'm like, oh my God, this book, The Firm. (laughs) Uh, The second Grisham book I started was so awful at the beginning, it's one of those scenes that always comes to my mind and I have to kind of push it out through prayer and meditation. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But I did read the Lincoln lawyer. Okay. And cause I love lawyers. Cause I think I would have been a pretty good lawyer if I had any education. Right. Right. Did, did if you... I went past the fifth grade. Right. Right. You just have to get into law school and then pass the bar. Mm. I mean, those are the, the, those are the hurdles. I could do it. I have, you... I have like 4% brain power left. Okay. I saw Defending Your Life. I know that that's a lot. I love Defending Your Life. Defending Your Life is a great movie. There's almost no bad scene in that movie. You're absolutely right. And how much do you love Meryl Streep in that movie? She's she... so light and airy and eating spaghetti and <laughs> right, who right. cares? Right. She's, she's, she's been freed up. It's amazing. She doesn't have to be intense. She's just with Albert Brooks, and she's not the intense one. One of my favorite lines from, uh, from Defending Your Life is, uh, I'm going to go to the bathroom, and when I come back, I'm going to hope that you've changed. <laughs> and uh... <laughs> and even he, when he plays all these really desperate characters in his career, like even from Modern Romance, which when I was coming up, Modern Romance was worshipped. Worshipped. We worshipped, went to see it at the Art in House. Oh, yeah. my God. And I was just like, there's two different kinds of people. The people who like Lost in America, the people who like Mother. Uh, I do like Mother, lo- though. I love Mother. I'm I a love mother, mother Defending Your Life Albert Brooks fan. I am not a Lost in America modern romance. I never saw Lost in America, and uh, I'm sorry to say it, but I loved Modern Romance, but I can't watch, and I can't watch him in broadcast news because he's so fucking needy. Right. It makes me want to punch him. Right, and it's not, uh, it, it, it isn't funny for me. Me. Yes, I, I want to. I want to help him. I want to. I want to either fire him, get him a different job, right? Uh, have him address his issues, right? And uh, none of that. I don't know why I don't like stuff like that, but it's it's hard to watch how. But some people they. Like my brothers, uh, my brothers love. Uh, you might, you might. This might be a movie you enjoy, the Godfather movies. Oh my God, I know everything about the Godfather movies. I know everything about the Godfather movies without watching them, uh, because uh, I watched the first one because my brothers have been talking about them forever, and. Um, I watched the first one. Got to the end of the first Godfather movie. Um, we have that long shot where his ring is being kissed, and then the door closes. And literally, this goes through my mind. This relationship isn't going to work. I'm never watching this again. And because uh, I thought he's lying to her already. And um, but that's the whole thing. That's the whole movie. Is that he is uh, full of lies now. By the end of that movie, he's a good guy in the beginning of the movie. Oh, and by yeah, the end no, of the movie, he gets he's a corrupted by power, yeah. Yeah. And so I was like, well, I don't want to watch two no, that's or three. end of two, isn't it? End of one, when he becomes the godfather. Oh, yes, yes. But that's and, not, uh, oh, is that don't ever ask me about my business, Kay? And he shuts the door? No, it's... Um, yes. It, possibly, yeah. And uh, all, all I know is that my brother, Phil, <laughs> said that our brother, Russ... 
uh, has a business venture. He bought this, uh, some either warehouse or bar or factory, some damn thing in Vegas. And Russ wants Phil to go take care of the, the business in Vegas for him. And Phil was like, I'm not going to be your <laughs> I'm Fredo. I'm not Fredo, yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to be your Fredo. And so I get all the jokes. But uh, did you ever see the scene between Fredo and Michael, John Cazell, Al Pacino, who, by the way, when I was in high school, I had the Serpico poster on my ceiling and I had a little, wow, I had a, I had a stenciled altar to Al Pacino. Wow. However, in this particular. You and Beverly D'Angelo. Yeah. (laughs) In this particular scene. John Cazell, who's like one of the most genius actors of his generation, who was married to Mer- with Meryl Streep. She took a break to help him through his cancer. Okay. Um, he was in five of the most seminal movies of that time, Dog Day Afternoon, Deer Hunter, um, The Conversation, Godfather, and something else. Um, at any rate... Uh, He's on a chair that goes back, like not a recliner, but almost like a, almost like a chair you would be laying on in the sun, uh, in the backyard. Oh, like a chaise lounge? Almost like a chaise lounge, but okay. they're not in, they're, they're in, they're sort of on the side of the living room. Okay. And they're having the conversation where Michael's asking him to please tell him the truth. And did he set him up uh, when the house was attacked by Johnny Ola's guys? Okay. First movie, second movie. This is in the second movie. Got it. And this is when Fredo was saying to Mike, I'm smart. Yeah. You know, I didn't want to be passed up. Being yeah. passed up by my younger brother, I'm smart. I yeah. could have, you know, I didn't want that. And then Michael gives him the kiss. Yeah. And Fredo says, I wish we could have talked about this before. Mm-hmm. You know, before this happened. But as soon as Michael gives him a kiss... He looks to his henchmen like, now we're going to do it. Yeah. Now we're going to kill him because he promised the sister that he would not do anything while the mother was still alive. Oh, And this is after the funeral. Ah, so Fredo's dead. Right. With the Judas kiss business. Exactly. Right. But the scene where he says, I'm smart Mm -hmm. and I didn't want to be passed over for my younger brother. Super powerful. You can count, you can fucking go through a... Right, you change your life. It is life-changing when you see all these crazy scenes in that movie. Yeah, that's that movie is... I, like, I know that it's incredibly well done, and I know that it's wonderful. Now, there's another movie, when you said smart. Uh, I don't know if you ever saw... Essentially, it's, it is my second favorite buddy movie after The Midnight Run, which is The Heat. I've never seen The Heat. The Heat is with Sir, uh, Sandra Bullock oh, and yes. Melissa McCarthy. I've seen that. You saw them. You saw the Heat. I was thinking of Heat. Oh, with heat. Pacino and De Niro. No. The Heat, and they were never in a scene together, were they? <laughs> uh, I don't know. But uh, Melissa McCarthy and Sandra Bullock. Uh, Sandra Bullock is a FBI agent, right? And Melissa McCarthy is a Boston cop. And um, I got to watch that again. Was that you, Paul Feig? It was Paul Feig. And so there's a scene where they're at Melissa McCarthy's family's house. And one of her brothers, not Bill Burr, but one of the other actors, has some of the greatest, funniest lines where he's just like, are you a knock? <laughs> oh, yeah, and yeah, she's yeah. Like, what? <laughs> she's like, are you, uh, are you not a knock? Is this the sisters? That's um, when Melissa McCarthy's brothers. Oh, okay. They're, so they're brothers. So there's something else. Oh, that's in the fighter with all the sisters. Right. The with- fist- <laughs> it's just like, he's like, I'm going to buy you a, I'm going to buy you a machine that blows yourself. Is that what, uh, that's good. That's what I'm going to get you for Christmas. And, uh, but the Boston accents are so deep and so like just deep cuts into ridiculous and every scene in the heat, except for the tracheotomy scene. That's that's where I was I was um there are scenes in d- in different movies that they're almost perfect movies for what they are right. you know like 2 weeks notice is a romantic comedy that is dumber than a box of rocks and I love it dearly even with Hugh Grant Hugh Grant and Sandra Bullock as well and there's a scene where she has to go to the bathroom and I don't ever want to see that I don't uh, I don't, I don't want to know the scene right before it the scene right after it hilarious uh 
un- until she has to start going to the bathroom. And then it's, then it's this Freud and shot, or I don't know what it is where you're just like, just, just pull over and, and, and deal with it. Anyway, um, like, no, I just want to fix it. Nothing's more frustrating than a scene that doesn't work. That doesn't work. And in the heat, there was the scene with, uh, the tracheotomy and in, uh, bridesmaids, there was the throwing up scene in stand by me. There was the throwing Wait up scene. Wait a second. Scene. You're talking about after they went to the Brazilian restaurant and bridesmaids? I think so. No, where she shits in the street with the wedding dress on? No, the throwing up scene in later in the train when she throws up. In the train? When they're on the train and she's throwing up in the train bathroom or airplane bathroom? She's either throwing up, she's throwing up in a tiny public uh, either train or airplane bathroom. Oh, no, no. It's in the bathroom of the wedding shop where Ms. L- Melissa Mc- McCarthy comes in and poops and she in has- the sink. Because the other one's throwing up. Wendy McLevin is throwing up in the toilet. Maybe. Yeah. Because oh, no. someone's throwing up in the toilet and then, yeah. That's actually real. I don't, <laughs> is that some comedy gold that I've missed I, out on? Well, you know what it was? I, it's <laughs> just me. them guys. Yeah. And for some reason, normally stuff like that would bother me. But just the way that everybody's sweating, Kristen Wiig is sweating, saying nothing's going on, nothing's wrong with me. And she's just getting... <laughs> pukier and sweatier per second. Right. And so there were times, like even when Kristen Wiig is driving, doing all those bits, trying to get the attention of Chris O'Dowd in yeah. that moment, um, which could in on paper sometimes feel a little broad. Yeah. But I think it was because, I don't know why it felt permissible to me. It didn't feel crazy. Right. Well, there are some, there are some bodily function scenes that make sense. But the fact that they were all panicked and they were in this really nice, beautiful bride shop, I think <laughs> was kind of fun about it. And then when she's just okay. in the street and she squats down. I'll cut it. I'll, I'll cut it some slack. Look I'll at give it, it again. A, look at it again. Melissa McCarthy is an absolute genius in that movie. And that's Melissa her breakout McCarthy, movie. It's her breakout movie. And I loved her in Gilmore Girls. Not going to lie to you. Uh, but. Uh, oh, I have to say something about Gilmore sure, Girls. Sure, please. Somebody said I could never watch Gilmore Girls because it was just too pattery. Like it made me insane. But you like West Wing. Because it had that same cadence, but it was smarter. It was still different. Yes, but it was yeah. much smarter. Yeah. But someone tweeted recently, and I don't know who they were, who said that their father had the best description of Gilmore Girls, <laughs> which is that the show sounded like a bunch of people leaving voice messages for each other. <laughs> Right. There wasn't a lot of interaction. That's not wrong. And I will say this, the first three or four seasons is, and you know how like a show will fall apart. Yes. Um, and Gilmore Girls was, was the worst, you know, as far as like, I couldn't watch those last two seasons. And then the reboot, I was like, I don't care. And so I'm going in, but I, 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 no, I didn't, I never watched oh, it. But I thought you meant, I don't care. I'm going in. No. <laughs> See the movies, the TV shows that I will watch over and over again that are not, that, that nobody's excited. I mean, it's just me <laughs> and a friend of mine named Kelly Fitzgerald. Uh, we, I like the first three or four seasons of Gilmore Girls. I love the first three or four seasons, maybe five of Charmed. Holy shit. Yep. We're different people, Cindy Campanero. <laughs> yes, we're we different, are. different people. That's how, it, hey, wait a minute. We're also at an hour. We are? Yeah, you did it. Ah, uh, that was fun. That was really fun. Thank you so much for being on the Dork Forest. Thanks for having we'll me. We'll do it again next week, Rangers. You know the deal. And uh, you know the rules out there. Take care of each other. My hat, my hat, my hat. They're dancing around my hat. <laughs> my hat, my hat, my hat. Well, what do you think of that? If it looks like a Mexican hat dance and it sounds like a Mexican hat dance, it's most likely a Mexican hat dance. So take off your hat and let's dance. Yay! Oh, my God. We, why don't we just call that as the end of the show?